you were to take out your phones now, please don't. <laughs> but if you were to take out your phones now, and you were to text or call one person in your life who would be absolutely delighted to see your name pop up on their screen, what would it be? Is there somebody right now, if not at this moment, at least before the sun sets tonight, who will be thinking about you, maybe missing you, maybe delighting to just let the thought of you come up in their mind or heart? Who would that person be? When Peter says in our first reading, as his eyes are being opened, that God is not just a God for the Jews and Israel, but he's a God for the Gentiles, indeed for the whole world, he uses the expression, I know now that God has no partiality. And to the extent that he means God is not discriminating, God is not hoarded simply by the people of Israel, we gain great comfort from that line, and we know that it's true. But I'd like to suggest that God is, in fact, in some way, extremely partial. God picks and chooses in a very particular way. Not that he neglects anybody else, but he doesn't just generically embrace all humanity. He has the ability to look each one of us in the eye and pierce to the very core of our hearts and chooses us in a very unique and special way from the moment of our conception in our mother's womb. And we struggle now and then to recognize what that vision looks like. Sometimes we want to be seen with that piercing truth. Other times, I'll speak for myself, I just as soon hide and take on another name. But Jesus says it so clearly in the Gospel. You didn't choose me, and don't for a minute delude yourself into thinking you did. I chose you. And he didn't say, I choose all humanity. He said, I chose you. And every time we read that Gospel or hear it proclaimed, we ought to hear it peace piercing to the very core of our hearts. I chose you. Hey, pal, what part of you don't you understand? I chose you out of everyone else in a particular and special way. And of course, there's probably no greater witness to somebody who allowed that dynamic to play out in their own lives than Mary herself. Think about it. Here is this person, this young woman, who had every reason in the world to say, you know, Lord, I think you got this one wrong. You should probably look for someone in the capital city. You should probably look for someone from a better family. You should probably look for someone who's more worthy than I. And yet she allowed herself to be chosen with an almost radical particularity. And for us, of course, she's the great Virgin Mary. But in her day, she was this young woman. And I've got to believe there were more, a few, more than a few people in her life as it unfolded and as Jesus' life and ministry unfolded who maybe raised an eyebrow or two over why this woman, why this family, why this man. And she allowed herself to be chosen. And it's interesting in scriptures, when God chooses you, there's always a change. Of course, the change is for us. In God's eyes, nothing changed. I've got to believe that the parents here, from the moment your children were born, you saw them, you had a desire for them, and you never stopped seeing them in a certain particular unique way. Of course, the details changed. They grow up, get into things. But think about, for us ourselves, we imagine that we're changing all the time. I did this, I did that, I hoped for this, I was disappointed in that. And through every second of our lives, God looking at us saying, I chose you. And that's not the past tense. I chose you, I choose you, I will forevermore choose you. And that really is as good a definition of vocation as you'll ever find. That sense of simply trying to live out faithfully to the way God sees us. And Mary's a beautiful example of that. She allowed herself to be chosen. She allowed herself to be a servant before she probably even understood exactly what that meant. But the identity was embraced and it was there. 
And because of that, she could hear from her almost teenage son, why are you looking for me? I needed to be in my father's house and not get all put out about it. Because she let herself be chosen, she could accompany him, sometimes in the forefront, sometimes back, sometimes, I'm sure, with a heart bursting with pride and other times with a heart breaking. And ultimately, there at the foot of the cross, she allowed herself to be chosen. And each and every time, her own identity deepened. And as Jesus looked down at her from that place, he could tell her, you are not only my mother, you are the mother of John, you are the mother of what would become the church. When God chose David, he began to realize his identity in a new way. When God chose Saul, he began to realize his identity in a new way. John was the disciple Jesus loved. Peter was the disciple who had to realize he's the one who loved Jesus. As Jesus chose him again on the beach, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? I chose you. Do you realize what that means? So this isn't just Bible talk. Every one of us here has been chosen. And how easily does that sit with you? I'm a committed pedestrian, so when I'm in the city, I always ride the L. And if you have the misfortune to ride, say, the red line at rush hour, you know you're always face to face or face to some other part with several hundred people of your closest friends. And if it is a hot summer day, you see lots of disgruntled faces. But there's one thing I always notice. Every now and then, you'll see someone all squished in like everybody else, just as hot as everybody else, just as angry because their train has been stopped on the tracks as everybody else. And there's this look of incredible serenity, sometimes even joy on their face. What's up with that? I've come to the conclusion, I've never asked the person because they might disprove my theory, <laughs> so I've come to the conclusion that when you see someone in a situation like that or any other kind of miserable situation and there's a look of joy on their face, you're looking at someone who knows they're delighted in. You're looking at someone who knows there's somebody thinking about them. You're looking at someone who knows maybe they missed them with a simple kiss or hug when they left that morning. You're looking at someone like whoever you would have called or texted a few minutes ago. And to know that we are delighted in, I think, is a grounding for peace and serenity in the midst of an awful lot of pain or difficulty. Mary certainly knew her share of that. And I'm not suggesting that the joy of know, knowing you've been chosen is affective, bouncing off the walls happiness. Sometimes it's accompanied by a broken heart or deep grief, but that's not the same thing as despair or hopelessness. So just on this beautiful, beautiful spring morning, as we think about Mary, as we think about the words of her son, allow them to be spoken to you and maybe ask for her intercession. If there's any struggle in your own heart to say, okay, I guess I've been chosen, but I don't really know what that means. I don't really know what my vocation is. I'm in a relationship that's struggling. My job is on shaky footing, or maybe it's gone altogether. There's illness, there's uncertainty, sometimes even fear. Okay, I guess I've been chosen, but what does that really mean? It's a beautiful question to sit with in prayer. And maybe just spend a little time dialoguing with Mary. It wasn't a thing I think she found so easy to embrace. And then especially because ours is an incarnational faith, find someone you can look at eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, and maybe ask them to help you understand what it means that you've been chosen. To the degree that they know you, there's a good chance they have some suggestions about what your vocation has been from the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb. It makes a difference, and none of us is let off the hook, but it's a wonderful discovery when it comes to us. You, like Mary, have been chosen. We know how she responded. 
Let her help you respond in kind.